Welcome back, everybody. Let's go. Time for another beautiful weekend. Here we go. Another stick shift. Let the adventure continue. Our first airplane's coming in. It's going to be a 737. Just like last time, I'm going to try to put every kind of technical knowledge that I possibly can into the video. Some of it might be repetitive because it's long videos and I, sometimes I can't keep track of all the information I put out there. So it might be repetitive. Take a look at the wall right there. Notice it's kind of reddish, brownish. That's anti-corrosive coating. They'll usually spray that on on heavy overhauls. I believe the product name is AV8. A couple of springs right there for the over-centering lock for the landing gear. And that little unit behind there is the uplock and downlock actuator. Oh yeah, I'll give you a nice little reference chart. This is how you would uh, service the nose landing gear. Right here, there's a little Schrader valve. As you saw, there was a big placard right there to show how to service the nose landing gear strut. Again, this is only used for reference that you can glance at, but most of the time, or actually 100% of the time, we have our manuals right there with us. This is an oleo strut, air oil hydraulic shock strut, and time to time, we do need to service the struts because they do get either deflated because of deteriorating seals inside of there, or sometimes the strut itself bottoms out. Or if there's some kind of a leakage that is permittable, but we can still service it. Don't worry, it's monitored. And yes, the aircraft can land on a completely deflated strut. It's capable of doing that. The airplane can take the punishment. The procedure itself is very easy. It's very simple to do. 90% of the time, it's not actually a leaking fluid. It's actually leaking the air or nitrogen, I should say, because we service it with nitrogen. Into consideration the height of the strut, which is the X dimension right there, as well as the temperature outside, then we can determine how much pressure we need to put into the strut. We would simply hook up a nitrogen source to the valve stem you saw earlier right there, loosen the Schrader nut right underneath it, start filling up the system until it gets to sufficient level. There are some struts that you might have to service from the top and bottom because they have a floating piston inside. For example, the 320 family main landing gear strut is configured like that. So you have to put pressure at bottom and the top and there's fluid inside there as well. But that's a whole different topic. Let's keep going. Go. This is a little interesting component right here. This is called a transfer cylinder on the forward bulkhead of the 737. During the extension and retraction sequence of the landing gear, the transfer cylinder gives a time delay for the nose landing gear uplock before the nose landing gear actuators receive the pressure. Works in sync with the lock actuator. You can almost call it a sequence valve. Give it a little bit of love, as always. Ah, looks like he forgot the, his lights on. <laughs> it's all right, it happens. Oh, we gonna look for you with the new cluster, uh, looks like. Notice, notice that the taxi light is no longer on the nose. There it is, it's all up there now. Even the lights on the belly are not there anymore. It's all up here now. Anyway, let's check the oils. Brakes, tires, the usual. This is the CFM 56-7B. We are looking into the left-hand side of the high bypass. Right behind the stator guide vanes, you'll see this little radiator-looking thing. This is connected to the IDG oil system, the integrated drive generator. When I say radiator, it's exactly that. It is an IDG air oil cooler. It will take the air from the high bypass, the cold air, and cool the oil and push it back into the system. Okay, this is the main wheel well of the 737, so bear with me. This is really interesting. The pitch attitude of the aircraft. Also another one of these little gauges that has the roll of the aircraft. There are two instances when we are actually using these gauges. Number one is when we are manually measuring the amount of fuel that is being put into the aircraft. To know the pitch and roll of the aircraft to understand how the airplane is sitting and how fuel is being distributed. We use charts and manuals to calculate all this information. Number two, 
This is also used when the aircraft is being jacked up. I want to make sure the aircraft is nice and level. There's also an option for a plumb bob, which you can hang right up there, and it will point down to this right here, which says nose up and nose down. There you go. That's all that's for it. A very rudimentary, very analog way of making sure the airplane is nice and level. As a side note, more modern aircraft has digitized this. You can read this through the aircraft parameters in the flight deck. Where'd you think you were? <laughs> so far, so good. I was walking by, this is pretty interesting. This actually comes out of a uh, 320 family and this is installed inside the forward cargo pit. It's the blocker and the forward cargo pit forward panels. So it blocks the, the blowout panels from being blocked. It was damaged. Check it out. I don't think this is repairable, but yeah, they had cargo pit tape on there for temporary repair, but yeah, obviously it's completely delaminated and destroyed, but it's a good look for you what a honeycomb composite structure looks like. Like that. Pretty cool, right? Oh yeah. I know it looks fragile, but it's actually pretty strong. <laughs> Not anymore, though. I don't know what they're going to do with this thing. Probably trash it. I don't think it's repairable. Here you go. I'll give you some reference what it actually looks like on the aircraft. Those right there. Those are the panels I'm talking about. It's one of those. See that? It basically protects the, the blowout panels, the overpressure blowout panels from being obstructed because luggage gets loaded and we can't have those overpressure blowout panels being obstructed. I had some downtime in the afternoon, no airplanes around, so took a little stroll, caught this beauty. I'm not much of a general aviation guy, but I think this is a Platus, a PC-12, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Had to go fuel up some of our vehicles, clean them up, and happened to see this beauty over here rolling by. And we also got a chance to go take a look at cargo, which I found something really cool. Check it out. But this was a really beautiful sight right here. The sunset was gorgeous. We didn't have any extravagant supercars today, but what we did have is this interesting thing. This must have been somebody's project for sure. But heck, it's a Bugatti, come on. And I don't even know what this is or what it's going to look like in the end, but somebody is uh, putting a lot of hard work and labor into this thing. It must be something very rare because I've never seen one of these. Heck, it's even got the original Michelin tires. Look at that thing. Almost had no rust, even had the original fuel tank. It was quite amazing. Somebody's going to put this back together and it's going to cost a lot, I guarantee you, because you don't see things like this every day. I'm glad that car enthusiasts are bringing back old history back to life. So, you know, these things should be restored. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Over to the side, they had these fancy ATVs. I think this is made by Polaris. It is right there because it's written right there. But these were pretty fancy. Nice. Not only one, but actually there were two of them. Somebody's really expensive souped up Bronco right there. I don't know where that's going, but these were pretty cool. I looked it up. Pretty hefty price tag on those things. But back to the line, back to work. The next office is arriving. Get the question of how do you get the shots like this guys 
just the zooming on the camera. Don't worry, I am nowhere near that engine. And also to make mention, I know not a lot of people enjoy the engine sounds, but whoever does, I try to accommodate. So a little half and half to please everybody. Alrighty, just got done servicing these engines. Need a little oil. This one's going out to Heathrow, so we're doing a full ETOPS check on this. My partner's already doing a walk around the outside. I got the inside today. So let's go. Hopefully we got no write-ups. Well, gotta change that oxygen bottle. That's a little too low for ETOPS limits. All right, time for fun. So I get the common question is what is ETOPS? ETOPS is Extended Twin Engine Operations or in short, Extended Operations. It's for aircraft that are flying prolonged amount of time that are equipped with only two engines. So there are very specific checks on that. I've made a video on that as well. Please check it out. It's there buried in one of my other videos. In regards to the oxygen, not every single carrier has the same specifications. But for our carrier, the minimum oxygen PSI is 1350 PSI. So anything below that, we need to change the oxygen bottle. Let's go. There you go. Where is the light switch? Welcome to the main equipment bay of the 777. This should be fun. Okay, before we begin, I'll have to say it. This is for reference only. Do not use this for any kind of guidance. Use your aircraft maintenance manual. And uh, the gentleman that was filming me is actually a uh, student at the moment. And he was observing and I was talking in the meantime, explaining what I'm doing and what how the procedure goes. But I have my tablet right next to me. All the maintenance manuals are there. So I'm following procedure. Oh, and to note, some carriers do service the oxygen bottle on site. And some carriers just swap out the bottle itself. Our carrier is uh, fortunate enough to have our own oxygen bottle shop. So when we can just remove that bottle and have a brand new one installed, the old one will be sent out to the shop. They can resurface it, hydrostat it, or hydrostatically test it, and then we'll have a bottle for replenishment. So that's how we do it over here at this station, but other stations do it differently. So again, it just varies. Okay, let's proceed. The little wire you see me pull is called a witness cable. I'll talk about that later towards the end of the procedure. So what I'm doing here is close off the main valve. So now it's a way, you know, the system is shut off. Second, make sure you always have clean, clean tools when working with oxygen, okay? Always have clean tools. All right. No smudges. No oil, no nothing, because oil and oxygen do not like to mix. That's the main supply line right here. Take that off, put that aside. Put the cap on. And then this line is your overpressure line. So the overpressure line is for if there is, let's say, an overheat in, the, in this area, you don't want this bottle exploding in here, right? So you want it to dump overboard. So it will dump overboard from here. Okay. So overpressure. Drop that off. Make sure there's no obstruction. I guess this one doesn't have a cap. And then after that, release that one. And then the bottle slides right out.
and everything in reverse. As you can see, it's not a very difficult procedure, but we still take great care and are paying attention to detail, making sure nothing is damaged, nothing is obstructed. And to those that are wondering, yes, everything gets torqued right there. Torque wrench is ready. If you were curious, the bottle itself is only for the pilots. This is for crew oxygen. And yes, we also have to leak check this. Okay, this is very important. Take particular attention on how I'm angling that crow's foot wrench. Notice that I am not going directly onto it. I am pointing it at a 90 degree angle. Reason for that, because at a 90 degree angle, I will get true torque out of that torque wrench. If it was straight on to the, the nut itself that I'm tightening, that means I have to do calculations to compensate for the lever angle. You go straight on and you set the torque, you're not getting the proper torque. There's a formula for this. I can't recall it, it's in my manuals, but when you want to torque something, especially at an angle, make sure it's at a 90 degree angle. That, mean, that means it will exactly correspond to the torque that you are setting onto the torque wrench. Otherwise, you better do the calculations. There's calculations for a 45 degree, uh, calculations for 180 degree, which is straight on. But that's very, very important. The reason why it's important because you don't want to under torque something and then you don't want to over torque something. You want it to be correct. There you go. Wait for a little bit. That is a full bottle of oxygen, close to 2000 PSI. You cannot go willy nilly and fully open up that bottle immediately. You will surge the system and damage it. Quarter turns, wait a little bit. Quarter turns, wait a little bit. So what you'll see is a bunch of bubbles. If there was a leak, you'll see a bunch of bubbles all over the place. Because this is soapy solution. After everything installed, we have to perform a leak check because the bottle system is open, everything is properly torqued. Now we want to see that, you know, there's no leakage happening. And there wasn't. No bubbles, no problem. Easy. Oh, before I forget, this thing is called a witness wire. It's basically a notification, a visual cue that the bottle has been opened. It's a breakaway wire. That's all. It's just there to notify if it's been tampered with or loosened. Since we're here, let's take an opportunity to look at the... Equipment bay on a triple seven, and this is a 200. If you are claustrophobic, this is not the place for you. Yeah, this is not a lot of space, very tiny. But to all my triple seven pilots, they all love seeing this. Most pilots never get to see what's below their feet, and this is exactly what's below their feet. This all links into your rudder pedals, your brake pedals, everything. Various amounts of linkages and servos that control all these functions. Not to mention the miles and miles of wire. It's bonkers. Right behind that wall or this lining that you're seeing right there, the insulation, that's actually where the nose landing gear is. It's the nose wheel well right behind there. The rest of the ducting is for avionics cooling. And you also have lots of important computers. pause it right here and I want to explain something. I want to explain why the 777 is such a special aircraft. Don't get me wrong, I love the 757, the 747 and the rest of the Boeing fleets, but the 777 is very very unique in regards to its computer system, its data transfer system. You see all these computers right here, all these little boxes? They control the aircraft. These are the computer systems of the aircraft and it needs to talk to something, right? So it talks to a data bus it needs to transfer the information into the data bus and back up into the flight deck. Not only that, but these boxes also need to talk to each other. And this is where the 777 shines. It uses a very specific data bus, something called Arink 629. I can go into hours of talking of how these computers actually talk to each other, but let me make it simple to you. Imagine one singular conduit 
where all boxes tie into. That means every single system is talking to each other on one single bandwidth or a single data bus. You no longer have to have wiring from one box to the other, this box to this box, or that box to that box. Every single box just simply ties into one big data bus or one big wire, and all the information is shared throughout one network. That's how smart this airplane is. Now, sadly, for some reason, Boeing reverted out of this technology. That was the only airplane that actually utilized Airink 629. They went back into Airink 429. It's pretty much the industry standard, even between Airbus and Boeing. They both use it, like just like that, which is box to box data not being transmitted to everything. It's only whatever system wants to talk to whatever other system. It's very isolated. But in the 777, it's free flowing information between all computer boxes. So it's very smart. And I, to this day, I still don't understand why Boeing reverted back into the Airink 429 system. And this is my own personal opinion here. And uh, don't take this in any kind of offense. In my opinion, the Boeing 777 is the best and the very last best Boeing ever built. But, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Everybody has their favorites. Lots of fun computer boxes. I also got a bunch of circuit breakers right here. This is pretty much for every system. That's where I came in from. Okay, the wiring also has a very important portion in this, the coloring. I'm not an expert on this. Tell me if I'm wrong. The blue is fiber optics. The yellow, I believe, is Ethernet, and the white is your just standard cable. My avionics people over here, go ahead. Tell me what's right. Oh, I also remembered. Somebody asked me where the main ship battery on the 777 is. Right there. That is your main ship battery. The 777 has two batteries, a main ship battery and an APU battery. Both are nickel cadmium and weigh about 106 pounds. Each battery has two sets of 10 nickel cadmium cells. They also have temperature sensors and overheat switches. It even has a battery cooling fan that comes on the side of the battery when it gets hot. The capacity of each battery is about 47 to 60 milliamp hours. It just depends on the type of battery that's installed. There are different variations. And the main battery can also supply the hot battery bus loads for about 10 to 12 days. And another cool feature is that the main battery can be interchanged with the APU battery. They're literally the exact same part number. Those things that I opened up right there in the compartment are gear pins. That's where we store them. These are the safety devices that we have to put in when we're performing, let's say, a tire change. This is to lock out the main landing gear and the nose landing gear to prevent them from falling on our head. Anyway, that's about it. That's what the battery is. And hopefully that person that asks enjoy that one. Yeah, so this is this is pretty much it. <laughs> Let's go. Keep going. That was a nice easy day. Hope you guys enjoy it. I'll see you here bright and early in the morning. Later. Day one complete. On to the next one. Let's go. Good morning, everybody. Let's go. Time to start off another beautiful day. Go live. Powering up our birds, making sure everything's A-OK. -okay. But I got reassigned all of a sudden from domestic to international. So I had to run over to a 787. Let's go. Start out with the 787. Good old plastic princess. Just came in from Haneda. Etops time. You know the drill. Lovely. I think somebody was asking, 
Where do you put the bypass pin on the 787? It's right here. Just put the pin through that little hole right there. That's what it looks like. Disables the hydraulic systems in those two cylinders that you're seeing right there. Those are the steering actuators. That's how the aircraft nose wheel turns left and right. So when the aircraft is being pushed out or pulled in with a tow bar, they put a pin in there. It disables the steering actuation in order to safely bring the aircraft in or push it out. Come on, let's keep on trucking. Gonna have a fun day. It's never a dull moment for me. I always enjoy this. Uh, even walking down the center body of a 787 and just looking around. Obviously, I'm inspecting, but being here, it, it's amazing. It's uh, you're you're in a presence of great engineering. And on top of that, I, who, who gets a view like that? Come on, you ain't gonna get a view like that in a cubicle. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You put me inside of an office or in a suit, you might as well put me in the ground. Yeah, I belong outside. The opening you're seeing right there is that says hot air exhaust. That's for avionics cooling. That's basically the avionics hot air coming out right there. Okay, so this is a 787 wheel well, and I want you to take particular attention to that green wire that you see there. This is very important. This is part of the current return network system, the CRN. Since the 787 is such a unique aircraft and that is mostly comprised of composite material, I mean, most of you guys already know this, unlike any conventional aircraft which is made out of metal there needs to be a path for component power return this is for a return path for ac and dc fault currents and as well as hirf high intensity radiation frequency protection the crn current return network in the fuselage is made up of multiple paths guys uh, it basically connects in parallel and it's for redundancy purposes it uses certain portions of the aircraft that are still metallic, such as bar, ribs, stringers, and brackets, whatever is possible, to transmit this current. Even though the majority of the aircraft is still carbon fiber material, there are still metallic portions. The network of these green cables literally run from the nose to all the way down to the tail. I've seen them personally, and it's incredible how they route them. They go from uh, very specific stations, too makes it easier to replace in case something that malfunctions or burns out but all in all that's what that is those what those are what the green cables are for if you ever see them <laughs> Notice the PDOS system on this one only has one button instead of two. It works for up and down. This is on a GE and X. Our door assist. I talked about this in my previous video. Go check that out. It helps the cowlings go up electrically. Moving on. Quick little inspection of the cargo. Open sesame.
even though I'm opening up a simple cargo door, my eyes are all over the place. I am paying attention to latches, hinges, electrical panels, uh, the seals on the door, the hooks, the lights, everything. So I'm looking at everything at the same time. Attention to details is the name of the game. Well, here's a nice comparison to you between a 777 and a 787. You guys seen the other videos. So the ceiling, they still kept the soft material. So the sidewalls, but the forward and the back walls, they turn solid. Interesting. And the smoke detectors are a little bit more complicated. Now they have a little blinking light right there. Works, works much the same way. And the fire extinguishing nozzle. There you go, right here. They look like that now. And just a quick little reference and a difference between the 777 and the 787 cargo. And obviously the ball mat rollers are still the same way. The springs, locks, and all the fun stuff is still here. The PDUs are a little different. They look like this. Got a little uh, optical sensor in there too. Pretty cool. But yeah, just make sure, we'll walk through and make sure everything's good to go. Sure the snaps are not undone. When we're done with the inspection, we have to close the cargo door, but it has to go into a particular sequence. There's particular lights right there that tell you when the cargo door can be latched. So once we put the latch back up in lock position, you will get the green light. That means it is good to go. I also have to inspect the aft cargo pit and this time I opted not to go to the main door but the bulk cargo door. Here we are turning on the lights right here and let's go inside. Let's check it out. Now I may have shown this in the past. This is where usually bulk cargo goes and bulk cargo is usually last minute luggage or even your pets because this place is heated. We'll take down a netting over here and go check it out. Or the main aft cargo I should say. There you go. Pretty cool. A lot smaller than the Ford. But same type of inspection. But that's what the cargo door looks like when it's closed from the inside. Pretty cool. I think I've shown this before. And I show some things uh, over and over again and I can't even keep up with the, all the stuff I show. Uh, oh, fun is fun. That big rubber band looking thing is actually wiring. There's wiring going through that portion of it. It's for the cargo door control system. They made it kind of elastic because obviously the cargo door opens and closes and that stretches with it. Now here's a pretty cool feature right here on this door. This is called a vent flap. It really releases any kind of remaining pressure to prevent damage when you unlatch that door. Basically a pressure relief system. That's all that is. But that's a cool look on the inside portion of it. Welcome back to the Plastic Princess. Everything looking good. Parameters are all okay, okay. No faults, no inbounds. Hydraulics are beautiful. Oxygen is good, engine oils are good. This is one happy airplane. Ready to fly, long trip. Yes, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, we are equipped to land on the polar ice caps because we have a polar survival kit. No, I'm just joking, guys. I have no idea why this even exists. I have to inspect it for that green seal, making sure it's not broken, but I don't have no clue what's inside that thing. I, I'm guessing it's for the flight crew or something, but I don't know where they would use this. And we are right back to the toilet system. I had to take this shroud off on one of the toilets on a 787. Some kind of a malfunction with the flush system and it was not basically sucking all the waste out. There is a switch. No, not on that side, Stig, the other side. There's a little switch there that you get to press and it will reset the system. But for some reason, it wasn't working. We figured out later on that it was the flush valve itself. It was completely malfunctioning. I had to defer it. I had no choice. 
I even tried to reset it with the circuit breaker, tried to do a power cycle, which is a good representation right here of how virtual circuit breakers work, but still didn't work. Had to defer it. Guys, just to explain, I can't stand deferring things. Uh, I'd rather fix it, but sometimes I'm just not at the capacity to do it because I am time restricted on the line. Also, there is sometimes parts limitations. Sometimes I don't have the parts available. It's a negligible system that is not flight critical and that will not deem the aircraft unairworthy. We are able to defer it per MEL, minimum equipment list, and this is why I had to do this. But, you know, it's one toilet. The airplane has multiple amount of toilets. Overall, the aircraft got dispatched safely. I got to stand in the jet bridge as we pulled away, which is a beautiful sight for me. You know, this brings me to some sort of uh, internal philosophy or mindset or thinking that you are not in control of everything. As much as you would want to fix things and want to make things better and make it work, sometimes it's just out of your control. Sometimes you just have to wait and that's just the way it is. You can apply that to airplanes and you can apply that to life as well. Give it some oil. This one just also came in from Haneda at a 787. She's a little thirsty. Check the lanyard. Seal is good. And we just simply use one of these. Come on. There you go. And we fill it up. seen that one before. Santiago 2023. Beautiful. Yep. Next office. Let's go. Have for more fun. Enjoying the skies while I do the inspection of the wing and as we are walking through it we're paying attention to the static wakes making sure everything's okay there's no leaks there's no damage but one thing took particular attention do you see that little tab right there in front of that vent hole hold on I'll show you another one there's another one right there do you see it this is quite interesting because this little tab that little ramp did not exist when the aircraft first first developed in the beginning, that little vent hole used to make a lot of noise. Aircraft that were on approach or takeoff would make a very unique howling sound. Imagine as if you were grabbing a, a, bottle, a bottle of something and blowing air over the top of the bottle. That's the same noise it would make when the aircraft was either, either taking off or landing. It was becoming very annoying and very noise disturbance. So what ended up happening is that Lufthansa Technic, which were the developers of the modification, said we needed to create a 
little vortex generator and they placed it right there and guess what it just simply deflected the wind away from that little hole right there preventing that little whistling sound as you would make if you blew across a coke bottle or something like that you know you know what i'm talking about that little sound that's that's what that was for is to prevent noise can you believe it that little piece of tab is simply to prevent noise that's all that was for funny you know what's funny i thrive on this kind of information because i sit there and i research and i try to read as much as humanly possible to understand why it was designed the way it was and the funny thing is there's answers to everything everything has a purpose and to all you kind people thinking that i know so much no i don't i am always a student i am a forever student to aviation always learning a quick introduction to this system this is called sids cabin intercommunication data system they're system one and system two they kind of break them apart because it is such a heavy system it deals with a lot everything from smoke detectors within the cabin lights emergency lights cabin announcements you name it this thing basically almost talks to everything at this particular moment sids 2 system had faulted and it was a secondary fault the white line at the bottom because it's the bottom not amber it is a we call it a class 2 maintenance message fault sometimes occurs because of a uh, bad power transfer but it's very easy to clear i'll show you right here that's not a big deal get a good little operational check not a big deal usually pulls up it happens with time to time during power transfer There you go, told you, no big deal. Just okay, guess what, the fault is gone. Yeah, and sometimes the airplane, when it transfers power from one system to another, it glitches, but it's all right. The rest of that is gonna go away because we're gonna get the Adaroos aligned. Watch, you'll see it. See, it takes about 10 minutes. That goes away. Now, I can't remember who was asking me, but somebody was asking me uh, to tell them uh, the basics on radio panel management. Okay, so this is going to be your audio management panel. This is going to be your radio management panel. Okay, this is how you select your frequencies. So you would select it in the standby area. So let's say you want frequency, I don't know, 12165, right? That's the other frequency here at LAX and you transfer it out to active we're using VHF 1 system you can use VHF 2 if you want see but we're gonna use VHF 1 for now then you click that that lights up if you want to hear it through the speaker you go right here turn the speaker up and then you put the volume up right here and then you can start hearing them now 6.5 is not that active 7.5 is more active Let's listen for a second. Okay, so if you want to actually talk to them, if you want to talk to Tower on this frequency on VHF1, what you would do is hit that button. Once you hit that, then you grab your this mic or whatever is attached up there. With your headset, you can cue it right here. You can talk to the tower on that particular frequency. And there's also various other functions. HF, uh, let's see now, cabin, intercommunications, all this, all the fun doodads, but that's, I don't have enough time to, to explain all that. <laughs> but yeah, that's how basic uh, radio function works. So we can do it on VHF. Most of the pilots are using VHF one, so is maintenance we're just using VHF 1 or VHF 2 easy and if you're wondering why it says 321 tail strike caution because all 320 family look exactly like this they literally look identical you walk into a 319 it looks like this you walk into a 321 it looks like this you walk into a 320 it looks exactly like this there's slightly small little variances and differences but it's to remind the pilot that they're flying a 321, not a 319, so it's more susceptible to a tail strike. 
Yeah, and trust me, pilots fly different metal throughout the day. A pilot can fly a 321 Neo and all of a sudden jump into a 319, and then jump into a 320. So once they're rated on one of those airplanes, they're pretty much type rated on pretty much all of them. Well, some more training in between, but they're pretty much type rated on most of the 320 family. But yeah, that's why it's there. Next. Well, I needed to clean my hands and this was a perfect opportunity to give you a public service announcement. Ladies and gentlemen of the flying public, I love you all, but do me a favor. When you are using the restroom or the lavatories, please be courteous and clean up after yourselves. I'm really, really asking you nicely because it becomes very difficult, not only for the cleaning crew, but as well as for maintenance to work in the environment when you leave a mess. It's very easy. Take an extra paper towel or the paper towels that you just used and just clean up around you. It's super easy. Imagine that you are in your own house. There you go. See, just clean it up and throw it in the trash. Easy. Welcome back to the 37. <laughs> uh, we're all over the place today. Get the engines a little bit of oil. This one actually stays here overnight. Let's do a little quick little walk through. Another happy airplane. This one's ready to go. Well, go to the hangar, that is. This one's staying overnight. Oh yeah, that's about it. What else can I show you guys over here? Some fun stuff. May have been out talked about this one before. So that's a mechanical checklist. Where well, we go the other way around, obviously, because you would check them off one by one. It's basically, in the post, when the other 737s had it, they used to have them right here. But on ours, we have this option. That's pretty cool. Awesome. All right. Well, this is the last flight of the night. Hope you guys all enjoyed it. This one's going to the hangar. And I am going home. But I'll be back here bright and early in the morning. Have the coffee ready. Later. Good morning, everybody. Another glorious day. Let's go have some fun. Next office. A beautiful 777-200. Take a look at that beautiful Rolls Royce. Put that right there. Don't forget it. Let's take a look down here. Oh, this, okay, so the breather is also. So, this is a Rolls Royce engine, and this is very indicative of a Rolls Royce engine. And so many of you have asked, what is that thing that is producing all that smoke when the engine is running at the bottom of the engine? It's that right there. This thing is called a breather. What this does, it takes, um, how can I put this? Excess oil gases from the gearbox and vents it out overboard. That's all it does. This is why you're seeing all that smoke produced. But it also has multiple functions, such as a drain mast, which I'll explain right here. Part of the, the drain mast. This is that thing you guys always see the smoking when the engine is running. Let's check it out. It's got a drain mast for pretty much most of the vital components on the engine. So if there was a leak, you'd see it over here. Pretty cool, right? Then you got servicing ports for your variable, let's see now, variable speed constant frequency generator servicing door. There you go, quick disconnect right there. And then you also have it for the IDG servicing door right here. I'm not gonna pop that open, I don't need to. But yeah, nice little look underneath. The Rolls-Royce Trent 800. Some thrust reverser access doors. Oh yeah, overall a beautiful engine. Thing is built like a tank.
All right, let's go ahead and finish up our walk around and then go upstairs. Told you, never forget the coffee. This thing never leaves my side. done with that flight and i always like to sit back and just enjoy the pushback because it's a beautiful thing to see let's go on to the next one all right let's go next office 737 this is an ng model let's go check it out make sure everything's a-okay okay hydraulics good engine oil is good no inbound write-ups that's what i like to see He's a healthy bird. I oh, can't help myself. Come on, let's go. Switch the guns. <laughs> I always love doing that. Next office. All right. This one just came in. It's actually a real quick turn. In and out. We check the aircraft, do a walk around, check the oils. Make sure all the big pieces are hanging, right? <laughs> they use. Oh, here's something cool on the Airbus. So these are the wing pin pumps right there. Now there's little strips right here. The reason that they're like that is because the wiring for the fuel pumps are actually outside of the wing tank. That's for safety. You don't want any kind of wiring that could potentially spark inside the wing tank. So Airbus put them outside the wing tank, like that. Interesting design. Oh yeah, so behind those two panels are the fuel pumps for the left wing. There you go. Before I end my shift, I'm gonna leave you with some knowledge. This is a CFM Leap 1A engine equipped on the 321neo. Do you see that little probe right there? that is called a t12 probe it's basically a temperature sensor it works much like the previous video i told you about on the cfm 56-7b on the bottom portion right here all the way in the bottom that's actually just a drain port water does get accumulated and it needs a place to go but on the sides these little ports right here these aren't drains these are actually pressure sensors these are called ps12 sensors provide static pressure to the electronic engine control unit then the inlet obviously these sensors provide information to make the engine more efficient basically to make it run proper that's about it we are looking golden hydraulics are good engine oils are good no inbound write-ups it's a happy airplane it's ready to fly uh, i believe it's going to philly yeah <laughs> what the <laughs> this is funny the clipboard, look, even the clipboard identifies itself as a pilot. <laughs> okay, you're a pilot. You fly. Anyway, she's a good bird. Well, what can I say, ladies and gentlemen? I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, this is the end of this week's journey. It wasn't that exciting, obviously. Not much happened, but you know, uh, I tried to show as much as humanly possible and uh, explain the details on certain systems. But if you have suggestions, please put it down there. I'll try to accommodate as much as possible. But once again, I just want to thank you. Thank you for participating. Thank you for being here, for partaking in this aviation journey and for learning. I love the fact that we can all blanket ourselves in the comfort of aviation and we become like-minded we go, we all become the same person eventually because we all start talking about the same things over and over again it's funny like that isn't it? isn't it wouldn't it be wonderful if the whole world would be like that just 
talk about the same things and smile all together. I'd like that. I'd like that very much. <laughs> silly thoughts from a silly man. Thank you all. I'll see you guys on the next adventure. Take care of yourselves.